There were once some 52,816 miles of paved roads spanning the Roman Empire. Even as the empire collapsed, cities and towns, traditions and cultures continued to thrive along the roadside. Take the Via Cassia, a Roman road in what was formerly Etruria. It ran from Rome through Siena to Florence, passing through the regions of Latium, Umbria, and Tuscany. In Roman times, the road was already a reconstruction of the Etruscan one. As with so many other things, the Romans acquired the art of street building from their former masters. Rome. In antiquity, all roads led to and from Rome. A million-strong metropolis, even in the first century BC. The city on the banks of the Tiber River was the geographical and political center of the Roman Empire. Rome's streets are marked by monuments from many different epochs impressive proof of the city's 2,000-year-old history. Take the Flavian Amphitheater, the Colosseum. The Emperor Vespasian's pride and joy, paid for with the spoils of the Jewish-Roman wars and gold plundered from the temple in Jerusalem. The Domus Augustana, an antique complex of palaces on the Palatine, one of the seven hills of Rome and the oldest inhabited part of the city, home to four Roman emperors after Augustus. The Largo Argentina, the most important traffic junction in the city. When the square was being rebuilt in 1925, this was discovered, the Area Sacra, the holy district. Here, the Roman Republic's most influential families built their temples in memory of battles won by their victorious clans. Excavations continue to this day. Uh, ah, that's Caesar getting angry. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are excavating the whole foundation of the Curia that dates back to the time of Pompeii the Great, and Caesar was here. This was probably where Caesar was sitting. Then he left and, according to the sources, was stabbed. Now we're excavating all of this. My name is Marina Mattei, and I'm an archaeologist. I'm a curator at the Capitolini Museums and the director of this excavation in the sacred area of Largo Argentina, right in the center of Rome at Campo Martio. I'm fascinated by the idea of entering a bygone world where all the layers have left traces. It's a bit like a surgeon cutting open a body and touching it. This area is alive, but it's underground. There are still remains under the cellars of all these buildings. Here in Rome, there are restaurants where you can eat among the ruins. All the restaurant owners boast, this here's an antique wall. Cats have managed to find their way in. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. It's certainly not ideal having animals around leaving excrement and scratching things. 
But we must be tolerant, so I'm trying to be a good neighbor. With their love of thousand-year-old ruins, these cats have themselves become an attraction. Under Emperor Augustus, cats too conquered the rest of the empire. Even today, a few people look after cats that have been abandoned, in the spirit of Italy's traditional gattare, the cat ladies. I think that part of the reason this area has become so popular around the world is the cats here. Thanks to them, we're rediscovering this archaeological site. My name is Silvia Viviani. I organize this little world. It's true that in Rome, the people, or rather the women who feed the cats, are called gattare, cat ladies, which is a bit derogatory. Amongst the gattare, there are aristocrats, magistrates, pensioners, students, housewives, the young and the old. Many educated people. I have four cats, and of course, they all came from here. We never take the loveliest ones, because we know that they'll find someone to take them anyway. But the poor animals who really don't know where to go, those are the ones we take home. My performances of the butterfly. Yes, indeed. I used to be an opera singer. And as you can see, the eccentricity remains. <laughs> but whereas my creativity never fully blossomed on stage, here with others, I have created something, something very small. <laughs> Not far from Rome lies Bracciano, nestled in the former volcanically active zone of the Sabatino volcano. Yet, Lake Bracciano is not a volcanic lake. It was formed when an underground magma chamber collapsed. The Latium is characterized by countless traces of the Etruscans, a people who lived in parts of Tuscany, Umbria, and Latium and ruled Rome for over a hundred years. These times left deep marks on Roman life, in the small town of Sutri, for example. Along the Via Cassia, 64 Etruscan graves open up among the rocks from the 6th and the 4th centuries BC, when Sutri was in its prime. Amidst the rocks stands Sutri's amphitheater, built to seat up to 9,000 spectators and entirely carved out of those volcanic rocks. For this reason, it does not have the typical contours of an arena. The Baremma, heartland of ancient Etruria. Right up to the 19th century, it was shaped by the Maremma Amara, the harsh life. Here, by the small town of Blera, the Romans built the Via Clodia, an extension of the Via Cassia, which connected Blera near Rome to the north of the empire. They are 
are some of the last of Italy's cowboys, the Buteri. Their herder tradition is over 500 years old, along with their regional horses, the Tolfetano. Butero is a man who dedicates all of his time from morning till evening to the wild cattle. So he lives in the countryside. My name is Sabini. Giulio Sabini. We're at the practice grounds of the friends of the Tolfetano and Marimano horses. And today we're training horses to work with cattle. Here comes the sun. Let's get started. The young haven't much passion for horses. They prefer discos. That makes it hard for us to find young riders to train. Luca, come over here. They prefer to lie in in the morning. But when you work with animals, you have to get up early so you can get more done during the day. He's a good butero and he's young. His name is Luca. But he still needs to learn. So I'm trying to teach him a bit how to handle and treat the horses. Fagli prendere un po' il, diciamo, il vero andamento del cavallo. You have to have good manners when you work with horses. You need to be sweet and caring. It gets you much further than beatings would. The Amiata donkeys have been living wild in the mountain regions of Maremma for 800 years, recognizable by the distinctive St. Andrew cross on their backs. Today, they are threatened by extinction, and only a few hundred remain. They are Domenico Galli's secret passion. See, they come running as soon as you call them. They come running when they hear their owner's voice. In the beginning, it was just a game. But little by little, I've been able to build up a nice herd of Amiatina donkeys. Initially, I wanted to produce milk, milk for children. Because it's like mother's milk. It's similar to breast milk. I haven't reached my goal yet, but little by little, I will. This is like a hobby to me. I'm a butero, like the others. Or let's say a little more than the others, because I'm always out in the bushes with them. Formerly, every big landowner owned them. Now there are only a few thousand left. Maremana cattle. They still share typical characteristics with the extinct aurochs. They were introduced to Italy from the steppes of Eastern Europe by barbarians in the 5th century. This is everyday life for a butero. When you have free-range cattle, you never know what might happen to them. They might get sick or give birth. 
So you have to check on them every day. That's Angelo Cornacchia, a great putero from Monte Romano. He's a great cattle breeder and a great herdsman. You could say we fought many battles capturing wild cattle side by side. There were many of us to begin with, but in the end, there were just the two of us left with our horses in those battles. We always won, though. That's true. We always took the flag. Me and Angelo, we are tough. Viterbo, known in Roman times as Castrum Herculis, a military camp that quickly gained importance thanks to its location on the Via Cassia. Five miles away lie the remains of the Etruscan city of Ferentium, today's Ferento. In its prime in the 6th century BC, it was also known as Civitas Splendidissima, and was a popular holiday destination for wealthy Romans. Even today, the ruins of the theater bear witness to its wealth. Its abrupt end came in 1172, destroyed by its neighbor and rival Viterbo in an unprecedented act of cruelty. Right on the Via Cassia lies Lake Bolsena, its eels were already famous in Roman times. Today, they are prey for Marta's fishermen. I'm Angelo Cesara, but my friends all call me Nino. I work as a fisherman. I've been living here since I was born. Yes, I like it. I've grown old here. Back then I was six years old, but now I'm 70. I've grown old. And I've always lived here. A decades-old ritual. Every morning, shortly after their return from the night's fishing grounds, Fresh fish is delivered to a cooperative not far from Marta. Great attention is paid to every lake dweller. In Lake Bolsena, you find these freshwater crayfish. This one here, this light brown one, is an indigenous European species. It's like a biological water meter. If there's even the slightest pollution in the water, just a tiny percentage, it can't survive. He's a bit like the boss here. He manages everything. This is the Bolsena eel, yes. They're so small because the season for eel fishing doesn't start for a few days. It's not allowed right now, but these will be thrown back into the lake because well, they're too small. I often take my car and visit the sites of Roman settlements. There they are, you see? We've abandoned loads of Roman or medieval mansions around here.
Everyone who stops here to visit the Etruscan and Roman tombs always looks around for souvenirs, because there are lots of them on the ground. Many are lucky enough to find rings or brooches made of gold. This used to be an Etruscan settlement. The Romans lived in Rome. The Etruscan civilizations were matriarchal, whereas the Roman ones were patriarchal. One committed to war, the other to peace. That's why the Etruscans were destroyed. I've been in those caves up there, and I've even slept there. There was a thunderstorm once when I was cycling home, so I stopped, and I spent the night in those abandoned Roman tombs. I slept where the Etruscans used to sleep. But it was nice. It wasn't bad at all. That's my life. I've been fishing since I was a child. Fishing has given me everything. My living, my family. It gave me all the satisfaction I needed. It also gives you a lot of freedom. Nobody tells me what to do. I decide when to get up and what I do. There are no fixed working hours. It gives you a lot of freedom. It's nice to be free. It's really nice. Umbria, a region with a 3,000-year-old history. It got its name from the Umbri, an ancient Italic tribe who migrated here from the north in 1200 BC. By the wayside stands Orvieto, it's presumed to be the site of Volsini, the most powerful city of southern Etruria and religious center of the goddess Voltumna, the most powerful Etruscan deity. Since ancient times, towns in Umbria have been built upon hills or cliff sides, visible from afar. <laughs> So too, the ideal city, Scarzuola, a 20th century concept. Hello and welcome. The monastery here dates back to 1218. According to legend, this was the refuge of Francis of Assisi. 750 years later, the Milanese architect Tommaso Buzzi transformed it into his own dream world, based on the mysterious Middle Ages novel Ipnerotomachia Polyphili, which had already inspired the Parco dei Mostri, the Park of the Monsters, in Bomarzo. At present, I am the guard here. But I'm also doing some construction work because during the 20 years that Scarzuola was owned by the architect, he continued to build and tear things down. For they were dreams. I, though, have to finish off Tommaso Buzzi's architect's dreams. My name is Marco Solari. We are here at the Scarscuola, which I inherited in 1981, when the architect Tommaso Buzzi passed away. Come with me. I'll show you Tommaso Buzzi's dream.
Yes, it's a life's work. I've been here for over 30 years, between the convent, the gardens, and Buzzi's dream. No, it doesn't scare me at all, for life is, in fact, a dream that never ends. It's a permanent process of becoming. What's interesting is that Buzzi used the system of ruins, which is, let's say, the archetype of the ancient. When someone sees a ruin or an ancient monument, that monument has the power to pull out from hidden places all that is eros, all that's mystery. This is not a lonely place. I would say it's a very varied place. There are so many different dreams that you cannot feel lonely. A personality like Buzzi, who left an archive of such importance, will keep on being a personality through his archive, so he'll stay alive. All his thoughts, his complete opus, everything that crossed his mind. On the other hand, the period when Buzzi lived was a period when people wrote everything down. Jealous of who? Of Buzzi? No way. <laughs> Everyone has his own road to travel, so you can't be jealous of anybody. It's Buzzi's dream that has been transferred to me, but then it shaped my own life too. Buzzi used to say that Scarzuola was for the poor, unhappy chosen ones. That's why he hid it in a forest, hidden behind a Franciscan convent, and closed off by a wall with seven gates. The Via Cassia. Along the old Roman road, once more as it crosses Tuscany via the city of Chiusi, and leads along side roads over Monte Amiata down into the Arno Valley of Florence. Chiusi. Along the route of the Via Cassia, one of the most significant archaeological sites in Italy. A city of commerce, known since the 7th century BC as Clusium. Countless Etruscan burial mounds and chamber tombs line the landscape. Monte Amiata, the holy mountain, an extinct volcano. Hidden at its foot, we find the tiny thermal spa Bagni San Filippo, the oldest natural therapeutic waters in the world to be used by man. It is fed by one of countless volcanic springs. 
Even inventors were attracted to the unique properties of the springs. In 1766, in the name of art and science, a Sienese architect studied the qualities of the very chalky water. A workshop wall in the town is proof of one unusual experiment. It's not plastered with mortar as one might expect, but with lime from the thermal waters, allowed to trickle across the outer walls for months on end until everything was covered in a protective layer of lime. Over time, wherever the mineral-rich water pours out are typical limescale deposits, such as here at Fosso Bianco, also known as Balena Bianca, the white whale. This is where the ancient Romans came to cure their ills. Later, over the centuries, came clergy, sovereigns, and regents, like the Medici. I remember these spas as an enchanted place where you could climb or lie at the water's edge. We would put leaves into the water so they got covered by a layer of limescale. It's as if you were watching a never-ending natural spectacle that keeps on recreating itself. My name is Letizia Contorni. I'm Gabriella's sister. And I came to this place in the 1950s when my father bought this hotel and the thermal baths. I'm Gabriella Contoni. We too are very different, but I think that's an advantage, not a weakness. The hot water makes these wonderful steamy shapes. You can see them early in the morning floating up. It's really fascinating. Come and sit down. Enjoy the sun. And then there is that smell of rotten eggs. Some people are quite amazed, actually. It smells a bit like hell somehow, coming from the depths of the earth. It really is fascinating. It's almost like immersing yourself in a bath of milk, isn't it? Even the color of the water itself is a bit opaque and milky. It feels like very soft water just gliding around you. Bani San Filippo is less technological than other thermal baths. We wanted to keep that special air of another time, this patina and a certain retro style. In 1950, there was an attempt to contain the raw, romantic, chalky landscape in a swimming pool. The pool was beaten into the stone. The next day, there was a big surprise. The thermal water had seeped out through the porous limestone. Not long after this, the Dolce Vita came to Bagni San Filippo. Oh, these are the ACF Fiorentina players. Quite a few celebrities have been here over the years. And those are the candidates for the beauty contest. Look what I found, a flyer. The flyer from 53, amazing. From 53. I think that was the first time they chose a Miss Spa. I would never want to take part. But it happened. 
and they had to force me into it, so to speak. But when my sister Gabriella was chosen later as Miss Spa, and she was called up on stage, she wouldn't go up. She hid. She simply refused to show herself. Just like today. So, a toast to the future. To the future. <laughs> Crete Sinesi is reminiscent of a moon landscape. Known since the Middle Ages as Deserto di Acona, or the Acona Desert, it's the driest region of Italy and ranks among the badlands. Asciano, a little capital city of Crete Sinesi, former home to the Etruscans and later the Romans. Back in antiquity, rulers turned the forested land into barren clay hills. Amidst this raw landscape lies the Abbazia di Monte Oliveto Maggiore, the Olivetans' mother house, founded in the 14th century. Thirty monks from this branch of the Benedictine order, dressed in their white habits, live here according to the strict rule of ora et labora. Their daily routine involves sung prayers, engagement with the word of God, and physical labor. A monk's whole life revolves around Christ. His life is entirely orientated towards Christ. It's Christ-centered. The life of a monk might seem gloomy, hidden, dark, separated. In fact, when you enter the monastery and start living the monastic life, chinks of light appear. I'm Don Andrea Maria Santos. I'm a Benedictine monk of the congregation of Santa Maria del Monte Oliveto Maggiore. I've been entrusted with the responsibility of head of teaching, instructing the novices. Our calling is revealed to each one of us in a different way. For some, it's a sudden epiphany. For others, it's born of inner labor. Of course, the training period, especially during the first years, is the right time to make sure this is your calling. We wish there were more young people committing themselves to this particular life. The whole process takes at least five years. But at the end of five years, you have to take the decision to devote yourselves definitively and totally to the Lord, which will bind you to the monastery finally. A 
Before I became a monk, I worked in the world of theater. I was a tenor. That's what I did for almost 15 years of my life. I traveled the world singing. It was a nice experience. I am Don Guglielmo. I come from the island of Malta. I've taken my monk's vows, and now I'm in the last year of my theological studies, which means I have no precise role in the monastery. Wherever there's a need, I'll stand in for other monks who have to be absent for their own personal reasons. If someone strong is needed to carry heavy things, or to clear a room, to do the spring cleaning, I'll usually be there to help. A serious opera singer's life is a very disciplined one. So, living according to rules and respecting timetables was nothing new to me. I was used to it, having done it by choice. But this stage you never leave. Because it's not a stage. So the monk's life carries on even after I take off my costume. I'm often asked whether I miss the singing, the opera, the theater. Of course, music is my passion. I like it very much. Sometimes I listen to recordings of my favorite works. But if someone asks whether I mourn for my career, well, that's another thing. Putting on a show and performing a show was something I liked a lot. That's something that I miss. But I don't miss the world of theater at all. Not far from here, Siena. Once an Etruscan city, then a Roman colony. According to legend, it was founded by Senius, the son of Remus, one of the co-founders of Rome. Further to the north, Colle di Valdelsa, known for its centuries-old glassmaking tradition, an art that the ancient Etruscans had mastered. Under the Romans, the craft progressed to glass blowing in the first century BC. Later, they would cast the first window from sheet glass. Today, the glass blinds of architect Jean Nouvel are proof of the modern craftsmanship of Colle di Valdelsa's glassmakers. Fiesole, in antiquity known as Faesulae, founded by the Etruscans, that mysterious people who traveled from Asia Minor to Italy 1,000 years before Christ. During his reign in the first century BC, Emperor Augustus, principal heir and great nephew of Julius Caesar, created the theater and the spa baths here. Under Roman rule, Fiesole remained one of the most important places in the region, until the rise of nearby Florence, that is. She was named after the Roman flower goddess Florentia. Founded by Julius Caesar, 
she quickly grew from a settlement for war veterans to a city. Yet, she only really blossomed when Rome's bloom had already faded. Ponte Vecchio. Whereas today we see the world's oldest segmental arch bridge spanning the Arno, in Etruscan times, a wooden bridge crossed the river. In the Middle Ages, butchers and tanners lived in these houses. On the riverside of this antique Roman harbor, there's a reminder of a tradition that is all but forgotten, the Renaioli. For centuries, the Arno was crowded with them. Many times a day, they punted through the river to recover a valuable material, river sand. Just like back in Roman times, city walls and palaces were built with it. Today, there's still a small group of Renaioli trying to preserve the history of those who worked the river. This one is very beautiful. They're the real old Renioli. Yes, back then it was all like this. You can see the long shovels that pulled up the sand. They really wore those waistcoats and hats. It was important to them. It was important to them to have appropriate and well cared for clothing. It was very hard work, but they were always elegant. Should I start? I am Leonardo Gerardi. I've lived on the Arno for a very long time. The Arno needs people to take care of it, to keep it all in order. I'm Paolo, Paolo Bruni from the Cultural Association I Reneoli, which was founded to save the last Reneoli boats. Our friend Leonardo is a real Reniolo. He used to work 10 to 12 hours a day. Back then we said from stars to stars, which meant from the morning before the sun came up till late in the evening when it went down. Those were the working hours back then, doing awful work like this. From 45 until just before the flood. The flood came in 66. Until 65, I did this job. And afterwards, they started to bring in diggers, dredgers, and all this mechanical stuff. So they soon took over from the old ways. In just one day, a digger can do the same work for which I needed a whole year to do. So that was no longer possible. I can do it, but I'm short of breath. And also, you have to be able to move more freely. Before the war, there were 200 of them. Now there are only 10 left. The association salvaged them from the bottom of the river. This boat belonged to an ancient Reniolo boatman. His name was Fortunata Emerni, or Fortuna, because in the old days, every Reniolo had a nickname. He lost his boat in the flood, like all the other Renioli. But when he was working on the dredgers later on, because doing it with boats was over by then, he found the chain and he recognized it. He followed the chain to the boat, pulled her out and restored her to the way she looks now. And he gave her a new name, Moses. 
It's the most beautiful name for a boat, I think, especially for a boat with such a wonderful history. Ponte Vecchio, Florence's landmark. In Roman times, the Via Cassia used to run across it. And here ends our journey along the ancient Roman road. Mm -hmm.